welcome to this new episode of A Shot in the Arm podcast, season two. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast about global health and human rights. How we make sense of biomedical innovation and apply it to our daily lives. Well, this week, we explore the intersection of health, human rights, and cities, urban health. Humans seem to have such a propensity, so many of us, to crowd ourselves together, to live right next to and on top of each other. Yet, we crave our independence and our privacy. Manila, in the Philippines, is the most densely populated city on Earth. That is to say, there are just under 120,000 people living per square mile. Compared to, say, the most densely populated urban area in Europe, lavoie Perre, northwest of Paris, with 68,500 people per square mile, or New York's 20, 27,000 people per square mile. San Francisco has 18,500 people per square mile. Well, in this episode, we meet Lance Thoma, the CEO of the San Francisco Community Health Center, a healthcare service provider that grew out of the AIDS epidemic and now provides an array of health services for the homeless and the neglected in San Francisco, as he would say, a safety net for those who fall beneath the safety net. For a city's problem may not be just about how crowded it is, but perversely, how empty its city centres are. For as crowded as our cities are, they are so empty and it's so apparent, so apparent in this gilded age. The very few that are able to buy up large sections of our cities have homes in many places or cloak themselves in the privacy of sheer glass skyscrapers, deepening a sense of sharp anonymity, particularly for those sections of the cities that are humming industrial hubs by day and yet silent by night. And for those living at the margins, Access to good nutritional food, basic health care and shelter may be even harder to find. So living on top of each other, richest and poorest, we have very different health needs and very different levels of access to that health. How then do we provide for each other? Well, cities have been at the epicenter of epidemics in the past, from cholera, plague to SARS. And cities' inhabitants have found creative, innovative ways of responding and and become resilient, not always by blocking others from entering their ports and their gates. London's cholera epidemic of 1854 was resolved by the installation of clean water and sanitation, led by the indomitable Jon Snow. And as we head into the heart of the 21st century, we are faced not only by the obscene contradiction of great wealth stepping over terrible need, but also by the effects of the environment, the connections and rapid communications between cities around the world, the pressures on mental health, changes in lifestyle, and frankly, greater consumption of meat. But also, we have uh, huge opportunities in front of us if we choose to seize them. How do we employ new treatments, new diagnostics, technology to enable to take services to scale? The response to SARS in Hong Kong in 2003 shows us just how relatively unprepared we can be. Brought over to Hong Kong from the Chinese mainland, the outbreak began in a local teaching hospital before spreading to the broader community. 1,750 people were infected and of those, 286 died. Yet, the outbreak outbreak forced a fundamental rethink in how to respond to SARS. We learned that quarantining swathes of people did not work. Rather, it was the careful treatment of individuals, uh, detected early enough and treated at the right and appropriate levels of care to protect the safety of those around them, including their healthcare workers. That was the thing that worked. And on a positive note, A worldwide network of laboratories came together, sharing information and learning together, and this allowed the infectious agent that was SARS to be identified within one month. I'm excited by the one-stop shop medical clinics that are popping up around cities around the world. Yes, by handing over your private insurance card, you can have access to rapid primary care and increasingly to complex diagnostic tests with rapid results. But I see these clinics as opportunities. 
as models for centres already providing primary health care to the mental and mental health service for the poor. And it's, it's not just going to be for the bros with beards and pearly white teeth who skateboard into their doctor's offices and out again. The threat of infectious disease, obviously, is a risk in densely populated areas. But the bigger crisis of having two worlds, of having the haves and the have-nots living on top of each other, well, that's one where we really can make a major impact. And it's an area where, like London in the 1850s, public health can be at the vanguard. So, to help us make sense of the challenges of urban health, I'm delighted to be joined by Lance Tomer, the Chief Executive Officer of the San Francisco Community Health Centre in San Francisco. Lance, welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Thanks so much, Ben. So, I would love to know a little bit about you, your background and upbringing. Um, I read that your grandparents moved from Okinawa to Hawaii. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Uh, Well, two of them did. And two of them were born in Hawaii, but actually they went back and forth to Okinawa as young children. Um, but yeah, so that's my uh, where all of my ancestors are from. But but really, they've been in Hawaii for the past several generations. And they worked in the sugarcane fields. Mm-hmm. Yes, they came to work at and different islands, and uh, um, yeah, and they worked um, out of those uh, jobs, and and then uh, actually became business owners and work their way up in different ways. So how did their experiences um, influence you? Where did you get your sense of service from? You know, I think, um, well, well, family was always critical and paramount for us uh, and community. So I grew up in a strong Okinawan community in uh, Hawaii. And so I do think um, where whatever called me to it, but I do know that... Uh, community service has always been what I've been drawn to. And I, and I saw that through my grandparents and parents and, and how they uh, contributed um, beyond, beyond our family, you know, to the greater community. You, you went on to university, and I thought this was hysterical. You, you, you started reading engineering and then <laughs> changed to social work. What was that all about? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's sort of the Asian-American story. <laughs> <laughs> where um you know i uh i excelled uh in in that field um and so i was pushed very much in that direction from my parents and 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 my school um and so um that's where i landed you know but i but in my heart i always knew i was a social worker i i knew that i think from when i was 13 or 14 um and that's where i wanted to uh to go and and, and this is a difficult question, and, and, and I apologize if it comes out in a not very good way, but um, in the course of your, your life, early years and then education upwards, to what extent did you directly experience racism, mm. whether it's explicit or implicit, and, and how did that sort of drive you on? You know, um, well, growing up in Hawaii, I think I had a unique perspective um, just uh, where Asians and Pacific Islanders are really the majority group, um, in, you know, in o- on Oahu, where I grew up. Um, and so, you know, I have a, a privilege of, of having grown up uh, in a majority group. Um, and then I moved to Chicago. And I do think that's when um, my own discovery of my ethnic identity, um, but then also I think um, recognizing and being out about my queer identity. I mean, I think that's where I was a minority um, or very felt like that when I was growing up, where I could um, express that and 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 come into my own identity, but also in an environment in Chicago that was highly segregated and very much a black and white city where me as a Okinawan, Asian, American person, um, it, it was hard to find a place mm. there. And, and so here we are a few years later, mm-hmm. and you are the chief executive of one of the, the most influential and impactful community health centers um, in the United States. H- how did you get there? How, as you look back on this, how does it feel? Uh, Hard, a hard question, <laughs> and uh, and it's been a meandering route. But but on, on some level, I think I knew 
um, after serving, um, being a social worker and then um, uh, being employed at the LGBT Center in Chicago, uh, I realized that where I wanted to focus w was on communities of color. That is where my heart um, has always been. And so, so I, I feel very fortunate that I found a job at Asian and Pacific Islander Wellness Center, the predecessor organization to San Francisco Community Health Center, um, where I could uh, serve my community mm -hmm. um, with respect to HIV and, and LGBT um, uh, services and programs and, and focus my energy there. Yeah, and you so you mentioned that the San Francisco Community Health Center used to be API Wellness, yes. Asian and Pacific Islander Wellness. Um, how did that change, and how did you know you had to to make that kind of change into mm -hmm. being a provider of health services for the community? Yes. So, well, I love that uh, that. Our organization, my organization, Asian and Pacific Islander Wellness Center, was was founded um, in the time of the HIV epidemic here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. focused on the Asian and Pacific Islander community because there wasn't uh, any services specifically tailored and competently serving the community. And so that is how the organization was founded. And so I do think as times have changed, as as we have grown as an organization, as and as we have really committed ourselves to the community where we're at in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, in this in this urban environment, um, the need that is at that has been at our doorstep, we we have just um, been there to serve that need, and so we expanded and grew and. And, and are, we are where we are today in terms of being a much broader health organization, yeah. but still with HIV at our core. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about who the, who the clientele are now? How, how did that broaden? And, you know, who is it that, that, that are your, your, you know, your clients? Yeah, well, I think it really matches our neighborhood. And, and I think it matches San Francisco, where San Francisco has welcomed the outsider has always welcomed and and provided sanctuary for those who have been stigmatized and marginalized elsewhere you know so the gay community the trans community the immigrant community the sex worker community um, all of these folks have found refuge at some point in time and even and, and to this day in the tenderloin neighborhood and so uh and and the homeless uh, crisis is is right at our doorstep as well because uh, substance abuse services, mental health services, um, housing options uh, still exist in the tenderloin, and so we exist alongside that. And and so we we have just been there to serve uh, our folks in our neighborhood. And the tenderloin, um, for the, for our listeners who don't know, is this this small patch of the community that is sort of pressured on one side by the financial district mm -hmm. and, and on the other side, the sort of growing gentrification of, um, I suppose, uh, um, what is it, Russian Hill and, mm -hmm. um, and yes. then leading up to Church Street and the Castro. The Castro. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you see people flock to cities like San Francisco, there's a, there's a sense of community that they look for. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's something that they find at San Francisco Community Health Center. Services for the trans community mm -hmm. is, a, is a good example. But it can also be very alienating and, and hard to find roots. So uh, has that affected the way that um, the, the health center has provided services? You're, you're building community mm -hmm. as well as dealing with this sense of isolation. I mean, I think that's always, I think, uh, has always been a challenge. And I think, uh, as you said, the dense the the density of San Francisco relative to other cities, but but it, the it definitely feels dense, especially uh, in the Tenderloin neighborhood that you talk about, and and right across of Market Street into the south of Market neighborhood, and so it is hard to find community. I think um, as the tension between you said haves and haves nots, the rich and the poor, the income inequality in San Francisco, it is it is pushing people to the brink. And so what we have always had to do was figure out how to not just bring people in to our organization and to provide the safe 
space, the welcoming environment, but also to go to where people are at and to build community where communities gather and where they actually uh, choose to gather. And so we see that as part of our work as well, to have a, a, a space, a concrete space, um, but then also to do our work outside of the four walls that we exist in. And I would love to come back to that concept of going to where people where people are mm -hmm. uh, in a minute. But as you look at what is happening and, and happening to the, the clientele of the of this centre, has this problem got visibly worse or, or, or is it just that we're paying more attention to it? I, from my experience, it, it, it's getting visibly worse. I see it um, uh, in, in, in a way that I haven't, uh, you know, over the past 20 years that I've, that I've worked, um, lived and worked in San Francisco. And why do you think that is? You know, I do, th well, I do think what you're saying, you know, as the changing demographics of San Francisco, where, we see the Silicon Valley um, uh, migration uh, from San Jose into our city, where we see uh, folks who are in that industry um, uh, come into our city. It, it either can push people out, which it, it is doing, or it causes folks, I think, to, to go into even further uh, crisis around their, their uh, home housing status, and their own sense of self, you know, and that's mm. about mental illness and then turning to substance use and then actually being on our street. So we just see that in our alleyways and, and our, and our uh, streets throughout the Tenderloin, the, the visibility of the homeless situation, um, you know, intersecting with the substance use issues, the opioid crisis, the meth crisis here um, is, is pretty profound. And, and it's, it's very interesting in the way that you all have have found biomedical interventions that we've had for HIV, and as you said, that's really the start and what what got everything going with um, API Wellness and mm -hmm. now the San Francisco Community Health Center. And and I guess I'm really interested in how you adapt these interventions. That you know, the cocktail, daily mm -hmm. antiretrovirals, or daily pre-exposure prophylaxis prep. Um, how you were able to adapt those for people who lived on the street, mm -hmm. who perhaps had mental health issues, and who may not be in a situation to have a supply of medic medications on hand to take every day. Yeah. Well, what I love, what we do, you know, is we have a drop-in center. So every morning, somebody who is uh, living with HIV and homeless or marginally housed can come in and, and have a meal and, and get services and from providers, but even more than that, they can find community. It is about the community that is created um, when folks have a safe place to be. And then to your point around by, and then um, weaving in the biomedical interventions and to have medications that we provide on site um, because most of them are living on the street and can't manage the medication. Mm. So even for some of our, our clients, we, we have a team that goes out into the street, into the shelters, into the encampments, and actually provide directly observed therapy and treatment around mm -hmm. HIV meds. So this is also what I think it what needs to happen um, here and, and other areas where we need to think outside of the box always around yes. how we get the technology and the advances to the folks who really need them. So, so you're actually looking after people's supplies of pills and then making sure they get them wherever yes. they are every yeah. day. Yes. That's a huge investment of mm -hmm. time and effort. You're also on the San Francisco Getting to Zero group, which is all about, I suppose, ending the epidemic in San Francisco. And, yeah. and I, I, I suppose the question is, do you feel we are seeing the closing chapter of AIDS or is something else happening? Well, I definitely think we are on our way. I'm not sure uh, which chapter <laughs> we're at, but we're on our way. I think what I love about San Francisco is we continue to progress and we continue to bring communities together to figure this figure this out. And that is why we are seeing, you know, most recently less than 200 new infections in 2018, which is phenomenal progress across the city throughout yeah. the city. Um, so that's amazing. Um, and at the same time, when you look at who are the folks getting infected, 
and African American and Latinx folks, their numbers are increasing, even despite the major decrease overall. That's problematic. You know, and that's something we can't ignore. Uh, and I do think it's about San Francisco looking beyond San Francisco. Mm. It's about, a, it's, a, it's also regionally, we have to look, you know, we just know that folks um, are leaving our city and going across the Bay to Oakland and, and beyond. And, and, and how we look at that um, uh, out migration of folks who, who need services or who have been a part of uh, services and programs. How do, we, how do we make sure that there's continuity and that we're not ignoring and pushing out the problem? And, and, and I suppose the next area of, of uh, health services that you provide um, that's really critical is around mental health and how you, ser- how you manage to serve those needs. I mean, my sense is that our understanding as society of mental health disease is still very, very much in its infancy. Mm-hmm. And again, biomedical interventions are developed that, you know, are, 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 are really designed for people who have some stability, have a roof over their heads, have access to cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. But how do you do that in an environment where you don't have that kind of security? What are the lessons you've learned? Well, I do think that, I mean, it's it's critical. I think uh, mental health, behavioral health services um, are critical to be, to have alongside medical services. Um, especially for the communities we serve. But I also think that's what we've, we know, even um, from the LGBT work that we've done, from the early days of HIV being so stigmatized, and still the stigma persists. And so that is that, that does mean we need to be addressing mental health and, and, fo- uh, and people and community mental health. And so we have always integrated that alongside our medical care. That, that's, that's equally important. Um, and and so what I what we do is we we provide that again you know in our clinic, but outside of our clinic. This is you know we have our outreach workers, our substance use counselors. You know they are social workers, as well as nurses and nurse practitioners, um, who are out on the street. So there are, I do think there are ways that we can actually provide this this comprehensive range of services to folks who are on the margins. Yeah. One of the issues that happens in densely populated urban areas is the issue of poor air quality. And and certainly for San Francisco's Bay Area, this has been a huge challenge mm-hmm. these last couple of years with wildfires in the north um, uh, north of the city and bad air coming coming down towards us. And so you and I are going to have a, a, a an interesting clash of cultures as I say the word respiratory diseases, <laughs> and I think you're going to say oh, respiratory. Thank you. Yeah. And and so so how have how have issues like bronchitis, asthma affected your clientele, and how, what how have you adapted uh, existing biomedical approaches mm. to support them? Well, um, I appreciate that question. <laughs> you know, I do think that's something we we need to to look more at. I mean, definitely the fires have affected um, the quality of of life uh, in San Francisco, and so our patients are are affected. You know, we you know our our uh, drop in center saw definitely increases in numbers during that time where folks came in just to get off the street. And for us to provide uh, masks and to provide extra support around that, we've we've always are responsive in that way. Um, but I do think we we can do more. And and I guess another area that you're exploring is around dental health. And and perhaps that isn't something again that we think of immediately that comes to mind when you look at the array of 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 basic HIV and and other primary care services. Um, how have you been able to incorporate that into your work? Yeah, you know we. Well, I love that um, how we found that out is it was our it was our clients letting us know that this was something they needed because they were in pain. They were living with constant pain, um, oral oral pain. And so when we started to listen more carefully and then we brought in uh, a dental student who was in his final uh, year of dental school, we started doing some pilot uh, demonstration kind of services. You know, we on the fly, we were just asking folks if they needed any sort of preventive care. And, and literally, uh, we couldn't um, 
do we couldn't serve the need that was there. We saw maybe 20 to 25 folks within a span of four to five hours. Um, and the amount of pain that they were in and what the the measures they took to deal with that was just extraordinary. We saw one we, we saw one uh, of our clients who actually crafted somehow wooden dentures out of wood. Oh. And, and that is how every few months he was creating a new set of wooden dentures just so that he could eat and survive on the street. And this is, and, and we we were able to to fast track him into UCSF's dental program, but um, but we just saw that we needed to do something. And UCSF being the University of, University of California in San Francisco, and 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 so you've been at the forefront of pushing um, uh, innovations, and, and you've done that also very much in in the field of trans health um, for trans men and trans women, and. Um, you, you know, there's a there's a cadre of leaders of community activists that come out of the San Francisco Community Health Center and who are now, I guess, visible both on the uh, the national and international stages. And mm-hmm. and 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 I guess, how have you done that? Uh, how have how have you been able to provide services that trans people need in an mm-hmm. in an accessible way? Yeah. Well, back to our roots um, in HIV and the API community. Uh, one of the first programs that was started in the early 90s um, was our API trans program. And it was an HIV prevention program. Um, and it was called ATE. It was Asian and Pacific Islander Trans Empowerment uh, Group. And this this group has been with us now for 30 years. Um, but out of that is what grew, I think, our trans competency and then because of the foundation that that we built around that competency, um, the city recognized that. And, and actually, we then, in 2006, took over a drop-in program that was run at that point mm-hmm. by the University of California, San Francisco, um, but needed uh, a community-based organization to, to take it over, and, and we became that organization. And so that program has is now called Trans Thrive. And it's a drop-in program that runs four days a week, and it offers a safe place where trans and gender non-conforming individuals can come and seek refuge and services and community. So it builds community, it builds leadership. We have a whole series of of programs and services um, for the trans gender non-conforming and, community. And I suppose a bit like uh, the HIV treatments and PrEP, um, the center... <clears throat> provides the uh, hormone therapies and, and, yes. and has them there secure for folks that perhaps don't have stability of of a place to live to be able to come and get their regular treatments. Yeah, you know, and that's what, you know, I mean, if HIV has taught us anything, you know, it is to make sure that we're addressing what a, an individual needs first and foremost. And in the trans community where HIV is a huge issue, um, that's not the first issue for most of our trans uh, clients. It's about hormone therapy. It's about electrolysis. It's about community safe space. Mm. And so so we've been able to do that. We have um, a trans drop-in clinic for uh, the community where we provide HRT, hormone replacement therapy, as well as electrolysis, as well as medical care and mental health care alongside do you um, do you guys track what's what's coming down the pike in terms of research and development and and thinking ah oh, that would be something that would be really useful and helpful for us and I'm I'm thinking and it, it's back to HIV and it's mm-hmm. it's uh, treatment and prevention but the long acting injectables oh. that perhaps you know the the health center could be the place where people get three monthly injectables, a bit like, you know, family planning contraceptives. Mm-hmm. Uh, to what extent do you do you follow that? And what's really exciting you at the moment? What, what has been a challenge, especially if we're talking about trans communities, is that the uptake of PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, has been actually a huge challenge. And what we're seeing is that uh, the amount of effort that it is taking to just get information uh, and um, and just the resources, just for folks to feel like that's an acceptable practice and and method of treatment, um, we're still in that. So when I think about long acting, I do think uh, and these options that will soon be on the horizon, I do feel like we need to actually start 
the educational process and the outreach and the, you know, and talking to the community right now. Because if not, these biomedical will, advances will happen and not reach the communities or take too long. And we know that now. So if we know that now, let's just get started now and let's just get the, the inf inf information and all of that and whatever research it takes. Because oftentimes what we found was uh, with HIV treatment and, and PrEP, um, hormone interaction, there was still some questions about, mm. so what does that mean about with hormone interaction for the trans community? And does that, does that have implications on, on different dosing and all of that? Um, so, you know, that's still what we're trying to engage in. So trans communities can more likely accept treatment. And, and sort of the conversation also goes the other way around, getting uh, the researchers, whether they're public or private, to understand and incorporate the needs of the, the clients you serve. Yes. So have you also thought about how you use data? I mean, all clinics these days are using electronic medical mm -hmm. records. Um, but, but, but as cities become hubs of Wi-Fi, and we see cities like London and Paris, um, you know, wherever you go, you will find free Wi-Fi. Um, and, and do you think it'll become a way for, um, you know, people who access your services, perhaps to access them more through mobile apps, whether those are much more simpler than the mm -hmm. ones that we're seeing. Do you see there's a role for data in, in supporting outreach to them? Completely. I mean, I do think um, there's a way we need to be harnessing technology more so that it does influence health behaviors. And when you think about long acting, as you mentioned, and it, and it may be a monthly sort of uh, regimen or, or, or even longer than that, what, what, is, the, what is the actual um, uh, regularity that folks need to be attending to their health? And how can we start to influence that? And maybe technology can help with that. Um, and of course, you know, electronic health record systems, and, and that's something, you know, we've integrated into our uh, clinic for, um, for the past actually nine years at this point. We started it, um, and that is a way. I think there's ways, but mm. but we th it takes a lot. Um, um, you mentioned directly observed therapy earlier, mm -hmm. and we dots as we call it, mm -hmm. and it used to be used for tuberculosis. Used to be, yeah. it is widely used around the world for for tuberculosis. One of the risks, uh, and, and this perhaps is not a medical or scientific risk, but more of a human rights risk, is that you can use data to track patients and mm -hmm. so you know exactly where they are and what they're doing and d does that worry you in any way well i mean I, I go to um yeah if we're serving the most vulnerable you know and that includes immigrants it includes undocumented folks and it does worry me that um and we're already seeing that with the immigrant community especially around public charge and what this means around the the future fate of of individuals uh, who are residing in our country, so so I do I have huge concerns about that. It, it, this is the contradiction. Mm. There's huge concerns, and at the same time, how do we how do we make sure that we're doing right by everyone we're serving and and have all of all of the folks have access to information and data and, and their own data around their health so that we can empower them to 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 take control of, of their own health and wellness. Mm. So I, I'd, I'd like to wrap up our, our interview by taking you back to the very early days. Y you and I actually both reached maturity as the epidemic was taking mm -hmm. hold. We're, we're sort of part of the war generation, mm -hmm. if you like. And um, I'm being... I'm very much involved in uh, working on oral histories and have been looking through some of the record records of the um, early experience of the AIDS response here in San Francisco and, and, and mm -hmm. came across some, some interviews with uh, one of the early nurse practitioners, Gary Carr. And well, there's a, there's a phrase he had that I'd like to read out to you and see how you respond to it. He said, I thought I would, I would be there until the end, that it would be over and I would go on to something else. Have you ever thought that, that, you know, there, that, that, that there was a time when you would see this to its mm -hmm. end and you would then be able to go on to something else? Or did you feel this was your life's work? Um, I'm not sure I felt it was my life's work. 
but um, being uh, entering into this work of LGBT health and and HIV, um, we didn't think we could see an end to that. So engaging in in this work meant that it was for the long haul. So I know I entered in uh, thinking that um, I was going to do what it takes to to do right by the communities that uh, that I was serving, you know, and that was the you know people of color communities, trans communities, LGBT communities, and so you know I do uh, it, it resonates with me, you know, uh, in that we do want to figure out how to get to the end, and and it's going to take a lot. Of folks doing that, you know, and for folks to 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 step away from that, you know, and and the the other inspiring thing is I I just see new young folks coming into this work, having learned about it and studied it from a different generational point of view, that is also inspiring, and they come and want to do work um, in the HIV field because they actually learned it in high school and college and graduate school, and and they're professionally engaged. And and that's inspiring because yes, I think and we that's were why. in the history books. And that, <laughs> yeah, that's that's something. But but it's interesting that that actually this is an entry point. Uh, HIV was an entry point to a range of services and needs that mm-hmm. perhaps weren't being adequately addressed. And and yeah. and to me, that's what's very interesting about what Gary says. Mm-hmm. The, the final thing is that you know, yeah, you've been involved in this all your adult life. How do you keep going? How how do you continue to be a source of inspiration to your to your board? And I should, you know, note here that I am on your board, uh-huh. uh, but a source of inspiration to your board, your staff and your clients. How do you do that? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I, I, what I have found in, in my position, I feel like it's honor to serve in, in this kind of a position. Um, because actually, I get I get inspiration from my board. I get inspiration from my staff and from the clients. Actually, every day, and and I do think that's what keeps me in it. You know that, um, you know, my office is right outside of the drop in program, and every morning I am uh, getting to talk with clients who I've known now for twenty years, um, and and that I you know I, I can walk I walk through the tenderloin every day. And I, I just see the need, and I know that if we can continue to 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 work and 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 expand services and and continue to build based on the need that that is right in front of us, there's no other work I'd rather be doing. Um, yeah. Well, Lance, I got to say it's been an absolute honor having you on the show. Really, really appreciate. Uh, you're sharing your thoughts about what's going on now, but what the future may lie. Lance Tomer, you are a shot in the arm. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's it for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We would love to know your thoughts on the subjects we have covered and issues you think we ought to address. Please do contact us through the usual social networks, including Twitter and Facebook, at Shot Arm Podcast. Our thanks go to our producer and director, Erica Spera of, of Newsdoc Media, and to Brian Ragas, and to our intern, Will Lansdale. And this week, a special shout-out to the BBC and its co-producers at HBO for the dramatisation of his dark materials by Philip Pullman. It has our friend, the European AIDS activist, Gus Cairns, completely enthralled, and it's a pure joy to watch, beautifully, beautifully made, if... I confess it is a little hard for me to understand, but it's fantastic and I strongly recommend it. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us and have a great week.